Chapter Sixteen of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Dash for Khartoum by G. A. Henty. Chapter Sixteen in Disguise. As long as there was a chance that the expedition might again advance, Rupert did nothing farther and indeed was unable to come to any decision as to his course. He had long since received an answer from Captain Clinton to his letter written as soon as he was well enough to sit up after arriving at Corti, with the news that Edgar had been present with the expedition, and was now a prisoner in the hands of the Arabs. Captain Clinton wrote in great distress himself, and said that his wife was completely prostrated with the news. He said, I know I need not urge you, Rupert, to use every means to obtain some news of Edgar draw upon me for any amount however large that may be necessary for bribing natives to find and if possible rescue him i fear that the latter is hopeless still if you see even the most remote chance of it let no question of expense stand in the way but even the promises of rewards that seemed to them to be fabulous failed in eliciting from the spies any information as to edgar's whereabouts he was certainly neither at berber nor at khartoum nor had the people he was with returned to Metemma. But beyond this negative information Rupert could learn nothing. He continued to work assiduously with his interpreter, and by the middle of May he had, after three months' work, made such progress that he was able to converse in simple phrases and to understand what was being said by the natives around him. In the third week in May, on his arrival at Corti, he learned that orders had that day been received that the whole force was to at once retire, that even Dongola was to be abandoned, and that Wadi Halfa was to be the highest point on the river occupied. That evening he went up to General Buller's tent. The general was still at mess, and Rupert waited outside his tent until he returned. He had several times spoken to the general on matters of duty. "'Who is that?' General Buller asked as he saw a figure standing in front of his tent. "'Clinton, sir, I am particularly anxious to speak to you if you can spare me a short time.' "'Come in,' the general said. "'What can I do for you? Take a seat there.' "'You have perhaps heard, sir, that I made the discovery at Metemma that a brother of mine who had two years and a half ago run away from school and enlisted was the trumpeter of the heavies who was carried off by the Arabs close to Metemma. "'Yes, I heard that, Clinton, and was very sorry for you. I cannot imagine a more distressing affair.' "'It was really no fault of his that he ran away, General. He was under a misconception altogether, and neither my father nor mother blamed him in the slightest. I only say this to show that he did not run away from wildness. No one could have been steadier than he was. It was a frightful mistake connected with his birth which I need not trouble you about.' We were greatly attached to each other, and my father and mother are completely broken down at the thought of his being a slave for life in the hands of the Arabs. Now, sir, for the last three months I have been working almost day and night at the language, and can get on fairly in it. Yes, General Buller put in, wondering what was coming next. I have come to ask you if you would be good enough to ask Lord Wolseley to let me have six months leave. My intention is to disguise myself and to go up the country with one or two friendly natives. I should pass as being dumb, as although I can make myself understood in simple matters, I should, of course, be detected, were any native to enter into a long conversation with me. I have seen Major Kitchener to-day, and he says that he has no doubt he could arrange with one of the sheiks for me to go with him, and to travel about the country with him until we found my brother. My father has authorized me to spend any money that may be required, and I could pay high enough to make it well worth the while of any of these natives to be faithful." I do not see any reasons why I should not succeed. I have been speaking to one of the surgeons, and he says that if at any time it is suspected that I am not really dumb, I can in half a minute burn my tongue with so caustic that if I open my mouth any one would think I have got some disease of the tongue which prevents my speaking. As to the disguise, I got Captain Hunter, who sketches capitally, to make sketches of the heads of some of these Arabs. I sent these down to a man at Cairo, and I have got up from him a wig that will, I think, deceive any one. "'It is a tremendous risk, Clinton,' General Buller said when he concluded. "'A tremendous risk, and I don't know that Lord Wolseley would consider himself justified in allowing you to attempt it. The idea does you honour, but upon my word I do not know what to say to it. It seems a mad scheme, and yet I cannot say that it might not succeed. 
you seem to have worked it all out in your own mind. To carry it through will require not only pluck, but unfailing watchfulness and presence of mind. A simple word or gesture might betray you. I have thought of all that, sir, but I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be done. I am quite sure, General, that if you had a brother, a slave among the Arabs, you would not hesitate a moment about attempting it. General Buller did not reply, but rising, put on his helmet. I will go to the chief and ask him, he said, but I do not think he will feel authorized in letting you go. I don't ask him to authorize it officially, sir. I only ask for six months' leave of absence, or even for a month's leave of absence. At the end of that time, of course, my name would be removed from the army list, but I think if I ever return I should be reinstated, or if not, I might get a fresh commission granted me. Oh, that would be all right. The general would see to that. Wait here until I come back. In a quarter of an hour, General Buller returned. Come with me to the chief's tent, he said. I think that if you can convince him that you have thought the matter out thoroughly, and are prepared at all points, he will give you three months leave, and will get it renewed as long as there is a chance of your turning up alive. Rupert was most kindly received by Lord Wolseley, who asked him many questions as to his plans. After he had again explained them, Rupert said, Major Kitchener has kindly promised that if you give me leave, he will buy for me two of the fast camels. He said there was a party came in yesterday with two exceptionally good ones, and that no doubt they would sell if a sufficient price were offered. Of course, I should not think of riding on either of these unless I had to run for my life, or until I found my brother, for they would at once attract attention. The natives could ride on them, and I should have an ordinary camel until the time came to use the fleet ones. I have a letter from my father authorizing me to draw to any extent, therefore no question of money would interfere with my carrying out the plan thoroughly. I do not know what your father would say to me on my return to England, should you never get back, Clinton. I am sure that if my father were here, he would approve, sir. Of course, I shall write him a long letter, explaining the whole circumstances, and I am as sure as if he stood here that he would say that I was perfectly right in making an effort to rescue Edgar. I should never be happy again were I to turn my face down the river now and leave him to slavery for life among the Arabs. Well, I will strain a point and let you go, Lord Wolseley said. I don't know whether I am right in doing so, but I cannot resist your desire to carry out your scheme for your brother's rescue. It is a noble attempt, Clinton, and I honor you for undertaking it. When your preparations are complete, let me see you again. Consider yourself relieved of all duty at once. Thanking Lord Wolseley and General Buller for their kindness, Rupert left the tent and returned to his quarters. The next morning he went the first thing to Major Kinchiner's camp and told him that the question of his leave was settled, and that he should start as soon as the camels were procured and an arrangement could be made with one of the sheiks. Very well, Clinton, I will manage that for you. I expect a sheik down in three days who has worked faithfully with us since the beginning of the campaign. He is the man I had in my eye. He has made journeys to Wadi Halfa and to points on the Red Sea, and will know that our promises as to payments will be kept, and that whatever sum is agreed upon would be handed him over at any place to which he may take you. In order to prevent any difficulty on that score, I will, before you start, give you letters to merchants at Wadi Halfa and all the ports requesting them to pay the sum we may agree upon, upon the presentation of my letter with your signature attached. I put it in that way, because it is possible that you may have to make your way alone into Abyssinia, and in that case, if you are satisfied with your guide, you will put your name to the letter, and he may then obtain the money at whichever port he may go to. All this, of course, I will explain to him. I will get the two camels this morning. They are exceptionally good beasts, and the owner will want a very long price for them. Camels like these are very rare, but they may be the means of saving your life. I will pay whatever he wants me to, sir. I quite see the importance of getting them. I am off duty now, and as the sheik is not to arrive for three days, I will go down to Dongola. There is one of the transport boats starting in half an hour. I shall want to lay in a stock of dye. Fortunately, the exact color is not material, for the natives are any shade between yellow and black. When Skinner and Easton came in from an evening ride, they got off their ponies, and Skinner entered his hut. He was astonished at seeing a native calmly sitting there with the usual wild tangled hair and a dirty cotton cloth wrapped around him. For a moment Skinner stood astonished. "'Well, this is cheek!' he exclaimed. "'Easton, look here! Here is a beast of a native squatting in my hut. Sentry, what the deuce do you mean by letting a nigger come into my hut? Now then, who are you? What do you want? What do you mean by it? Out you go sharp, or I will break your neck!' The two young officers— for Easton had joined his friend, 
stood astounded when the native broke into a yell of laughter. "'He is mad, Easton. He is a mad nigger who has escaped from a lunatic asylum,' Skinner exclaimed. "'Don't go near him. Perhaps he bites, and you might get hydrophobia.' "'How is this, sentry?' he asked, turning to the soldier who had come up to the door. "'How is it you let this mad nigger come in here?' "'I did not see him come in, sir,' the sentry said. "'He must have slipped in when my back was turned.' I saw an officer come in half an hour ago, but I haven't seen anyone else. Well, move him out, sentry. Prod him up with your bayonet if he won't go. The sentry was about to enter the tent when Rupert gasped. That is enough, Skinner. Order him out. You will kill me with laughing. Clinton! The word broke from the lips of Easton and Skinner simultaneously, while the sentry almost dropped his rifle in surprise at hearing his officer thus addressed in pure English by the native. "'It is all right, sentry. You can go,' Easton said, recovering himself first from his astonishment, and then saying, as soon as they were alone, "'What on earth does this masquerade mean, Clinton? Have you gone out of your mind?' "'Then you think I shall do, Easton?' "'Do?' Easton repeated, the truth dawning upon him. "'You don't mean to say that you are going to carry out that scheme you talked about a month since?' "'Indeed I do, Easton. I have obtained the chief's permission.' Major Kitchener is making the arrangements for me, and I hope in another three days to be out on the desert again. At any rate, you will allow that as far as appearances go, I can pass fairly as a native. Skinner had not yet spoken. He now walked round and round Rupert two or three times, and at last gave vent to his feelings. Well, I am jiggered. There is no doubt about your disguise, Clinton, at least if you are Clinton and not a nigger who has stolen his voice. Did you ever see such a head of hair, Easton? "'Never mind that,' Easton said impatiently. "'Don't you understand, man, that Clinton is going away among those Arabs to search for his brother?' "'No, I did not understand. In fact, I did not hear a word that was said. I was too much stunned to do anything but stare. And you are really going, Clinton, old fellow?' "'Yes, I am off tomorrow at daybreak for Corti. There is a good strong breeze blowing, and I shall go up as quickly as I came down. There was a delay of three or four days before we could get hold of the man I am to go with.' if he will take me, so I ran down here partly to get some dyes for my skin in the bazaar here, but principally to say good-bye to you both. My wig, that so astonishes you, Skinner, I had made at Cairo and sent up. Well, there is no fear, Clinton, of any one recognizing you as an Englishman. You may ride in the middle of them from here to Khartoum, and they would never suspect you as far as looks go. You have abandoned that idea about your tongue, I hope. Yes, I have got a bottle of caustic from one of the surgeons. He put me up to it. He says if I see that I am suspected, if I slip aside and rub one of these little sticks of caustic over my tongue, it will make such a sight of it that I have only to open my mouth and let them look at it, and they will believe readily enough that I have got some frightful disease in my tongue and cannot use it. In case of necessity, I can mumble out a few words, and the state of my mouth will quite account for any difficulty they may have in understanding me. "'Will that stuff you have got on your skin wash off?' Easton asked. "'Yes, this will, with a little difficulty. But I have got some other stuff that my interpreter tells me will only want renewing once a week or ten days. "'Then, for goodness sake, set to and get it off, Clinton, and put on your own clothes, and let us see you again as you are. I don't seem to be able to talk to you naturally in that disguise, and it will be a long time before we get another talk together.' Rupert at once set to work with soap, water, and a nail brush, and in a quarter of an hour got his face and hands tolerably white. Then he put on his uniform. "'Now you are yourself again, Clinton. Sit down and tell us all about it. What are your plans?' Rupert told him the arrangement that Major Kitchener was making for him, and both his companions greatly approved of the purchase of the fast camels. "'That is a capital idea, and if you can get a good start with them, you may laugh at Arabs who are mounted on ordinary camels or on foot.' but you must mind that there are no fellows with horses about when you make your bolt. You see, all these fellows who led the attacks were mounted, and I suppose you will find that a few of the principal men in every large village have horses. Now a horse will go faster than the fastest camel for a bit, although the camel will beat him in a long-distance race. What are you going to do about arms? I cannot take any arms, Easton. They would betray me at once. You cannot show any, I grant, but there is no reason in the world why you shouldn't take a brace of revolvers. They could be stowed away easily enough, with a couple boxes of cartridges, somewhere in the saddle. There is room to hide anything in one of those great clumsy contrivances. Of course, pistols would be of no use to you if you are discovered in the middle of a tribe or a big town. 
but if you find your brother and you make a bolt for it together on these camels and are pursued you could make a pretty good fight against half a dozen mounted men and the betting is against more than that getting together if you had a revolver apiece i should advise you most strongly to take them i think you are right easton i will certainly do so have you got a brace no i have only one then you shall have mine old fellow what caliber is yours forty-five ah that is the same as mine i've got a couple of boxes of cartridges and as they are done up in india rubber they are sure to be all right by the way is it true that we are all going down there was a rumor last night that orders had come yes we are to retire to wadi halfa what an abandoned dongola rupert nodded then i call it a beastly shame more than that i call it a downright dishonorable action easton said hotly here we are going to abandon a town of some twenty thousand inhabitants to these fanatics not only that but to give up to their vengeance all the tribes between wadi halfa and metemah who have trusted in our promises have thrown in their lot with us and have for the last four months been doing all our transport our fathers used to be proud to call themselves englishmen but by jove there is very little reason for us to be that boer business was shameful and humiliating enough but this is worse still i don't say that we are bound to go on to khartoum although it would be the best and cheapest and most satisfactory mode in every way of settling this mahdi and ensuring order in the sudan but i do think that we are bound to hold the river from Cordy downwards to protect the tribes that have been friendly to us and to save this town from ruin and desolation not only this town but all the peaceful villages down the river besides so long as we are here the arabs will see that the mahdi is not all-powerful and may sooner or later rise against his tyranny well i never thought this campaign was going to end in the disgraceful abandonment of the nile valley from Cordy to wadi halfa however he went on checking himself suddenly it is of no use talking of that now we have got to think about your expedition which to us three is a far more important business how does your arabic get on fairly well i don't say that i can talk a great deal but as i have learnt it by ear i speak with a fair accent at least so ibrahim says i have taken particular pains with what you may call salutations such as one man gives another as they pass each other on a journey or what one says on entering a house or a village i can ask for food all right return thanks for hospitality ask the way and all that sort of thing and ibrahim said that in all these things i could pass very well as a native especially as there are slight distinctions and differences between the language of the various tribes they are a very mixed people of arab egyptian and negro blood so that as far as it goes my language will pass and of course every day i travel i shall improve i intend as i have said to pretend to be dumb whenever we come across strong parties of strangers and my sheik will shield me as much as possible by sending me out to look after the camels and to gather wood and to fetch water or on other business whenever we are with strangers i really think easton i have a very fair chance of getting through it without being found out major kitchener tells me that the sheik has only two or three of his tribesmen with him and that he has no doubt picked men he can trust to hold their tongues otherwise he would get into a mess when he went back again among his people of course the men will be promised a reward also if i get safely through the trouble on my mind is more the difficulty there will be in finding edgar and getting him off than about myself in the first place there is no saying as to the direction in which the men who have got him have gone they have probably gone to some out-of-the-way place so as to be out of the way of the mahdi's people ibrahim tells me that there are no people more pig-headed than these arabs and if they make up their mind to a thing nothing will turn them that is all the better as far as the risk of edgar falling into the hands of the mahdi is concerned only it makes all the more difficult to find him there is no saying where he may have moved to he may have gone far south of khatoum he may have pushed away near the borders of abyssinia he may be within a few miles of Suhakim. he may be in the desert we crossed i don't disguise for myself that it is likely to be a long search but that is nothing if i am but successful at last of course the great thing will be to endeavor to pick up a clue near metema the tribe is a very scattered one and is to be found dispersed among other tribes all the way from berber to khartoum on the eastern side of the river and i hear that there is a branch of it who live in the desert to the west well it is likely that edgar's master will have stopped in some of these villages among his own people if only for a few hours and it is from them i hope to get some clue as to the general direction at least in which they were traveling 
unless they disguised Edgar and wrapped him up as a woman, or something of that sort, the fact of a white prisoner passing through is certain to have caused talk. However, it is impossible to say where or how I may find a clue. At any rate, I shall stick to it. I shall tell my father that as it may take me a year to find Edgar, he need not even begin to feel anxious until the end of that time, and that as I shall be continually improving in my knowledge of the language, the risk of detection will become less and less every month, and that I anticipate no difficulty whatever when the time comes in passing down to Suakim or Masoa, or, should any difficulty arise in that direction, in either working down to Wadi Halfa or through Abyssinia. They sat and talked until far into the night, and then lay down for a few hours' sleep, and at daybreak Rupert said good-bye to his friends and took his place in the boat, which, spreading its sails, rapidly made its way upstream. The two friends stood for a long time looking after it. "'By Jove, Clinton has turned out a fine fellow,' Skinner said. "'A grand fellow. I hardly thought he had it in him. Of course I knew he was plucky and all that sort of thing, but this is a tremendous undertaking.' It is, Easton said. Of course, now the die is cast, I would not say a word last night to discourage him. But the risk is tremendous. However, he is going about it in the right spirit, and somehow I feel almost confident that he will pull through it, and that we shall shake his hand in England again. May God protect him on his journey. Skinner responded with an earnest amen, and then they walked slowly back to the camp. As soon as he arrived at Corti, Rupert made his way to Major Kitchener's, and was greeted with a cheery welcome by that officer. "'Things are going well, Clinton. I have bought the two riding camels. I was a whole day haggling over the price with the chief. I had to pay a stiff price after all, but that I expected. But it won't come quite so heavy because he wanted to take it out in goods, and as we don't mean to take all the things back to the coast again, I got an order from the chief for our quartermaster's department to sell me a lot of rugs, cooking pots, and tin goods, and also some powder and ball and a dozen muskets. As I get them cheap, the camels won't cost you more than half what they would if you had to pay in silver for them. In the next place, the sheik arrived yesterday afternoon, and I had a long talk with him. He is willing enough to undertake the business and to wander about with you for as many months as you may choose, and to assist you in getting off your brother if you find him, if he thinks that you can disguise yourself well enough to pass as a native, but of that he is to be the judge. He won't take you at any price unless you satisfy him in that respect. "'I think I can do that, Major,' Rupert said. "'I will go back to my tent and dress now. I took in two of my friends of the guards, and I think I can pass inspection even by a native.' In half an hour, Rupert returned in his native get-up, carrying, as usual, a spear and a sword and two or three knives stuck in his girdle. Major Kitchener was inside his tent, and Rupert squatted down outside and awaited his coming out. When the Major issued from his tent, his eye fell upon him. "'Hello,' he said in Arabic. "'What do you want? Where do you come from?' "'I am my lord's servant,' Rupert replied in the same language. "'Yes, that is all very well, but I suppose you want something.' I am ready to go for my lord to Khartoum and to bring him news. Major Kinchener shook his head. I don't want to send anyone up at present, he said. We all know about it. Then you think I shall do, Major, Rupert said in English. Bless me, the officer exclaimed. Is that you, Clinton? I did not suspect you for a moment. You will do, lad, you will do. The sheik himself won't know you to be white with that wonderful head of hair of yours. It is a splendid imitation. One would think you had scalped one of these natives and put his hair on. Come along with me. You will see how we shall take in the sheik. He went across to a small group of camels, by the side of which a sheik and two natives were seated, talking and gesticulating violently. The sheik rose to his feet as they came up and began to talk volubly. He was evidently in a rage with his followers, for he pointed to them with open hand and was complaining of their conduct. Presently, they began to interject angry denials, and then sprang to their feet, and excitedly poured out their view of the question. Rupert could not catch a word, and had no idea of the subject of the dispute, although he saw that Major Kitchener was listening with some amusement. The combat rose higher and higher. At last, with a sudden gesture, the sheik, who had looked furtively at this disguised stranger several times, seized the two men by the arm and whirled them round until they faced Rupert, who was leaning on his spear. "'There!' he shouted. Where are the eyes you boast of? You say that anyone could in a moment detect a white man through his disguises. What? Are you then blind or idiots that you do not see that this is a white man standing here? The Arabs stood motionless, wondering and incredulous, while the chief broke into a triumphant laugh at his own superior sagacity. Is he white? 
one of the men asked turning to the major yes this is the officer who is to travel with you what is it all about major rupert asked as the three natives proceeded to walk round him and examine him from every point the sheik was declaiming against the obstinacy of his followers he really wants to take you and was in vain trying to persuade his men that such clever people as the whites could disguise themselves so that they would not be known the two men protested against the risk but maintained that anyone could tell a white from a native a mile off really the sheik did not suspect you in the slightest but i thought it was well to let him have a triumph over his followers and so as he was going on i gave a little nod towards you and he caught it at once but i could see at first he thought he was mistaken and while the others were having their say i nodded to him and said yes it is he with many interjections it is wonderful can such things be eyes have never seen it the three arabs had continued to gaze at rupert while the officer was speaking it is a white man the sheik said at last there is more flesh on his limbs than on those of a young arab but whoever saw such hair on a white man by what miracle did it grow thus it is what is called a wig major kitchener explained it was made for him at cairo he can take it on and off take it off clinton robert pulled off his wig and stood before them in his closely cropped head the natives made a step or two backwards in astonishment and awe the whites are great people the sheik said they can turn a white man into a black they can put an arab's hair on to their heads so that they can take it on and off like a turban it is well my lord we will take the young officer with us but he must remember that though when he is standing still he may so look like an arab that no eyes could detect him it is the movements and the ways and the tongue and not the skin and hair only that make the man he will have to keep a watch always over himself and be ever careful and prudent for were he discovered it would cost him his life and would go hard with us also for bringing him as a spy into the land we know that sheik major kitchener said and all that has you know been considered in the handsome terms we have offered you if he spoke the language as you do my lord it would be easy it will not be long before he does so sheik you will see that he speaks with a fair accent already just suppose that you are the sheik of a village and that he has come in to get something now clinton begin with the usual arabic salutations rupert at once addressed the sheik and the usual ceremonial salutations which precede all conversation were exchanged between him i have wandered from my camp rupert went on my camel has traveled far and i am hungry and athirst i would buy meal and dates for my further journey and a feed of grain for the camel he continued with a dozen other sentences that he had committed to heart and gone over scores of time with ibrahim the sheik nodded his approval it is good he said for a time as you have said he will not talk but will go as an afflicted one who has lost his speech but even now he could pass through a village with us without exciting suspicion we will take him what say you he asked his followers who replied together we will take him then there was a long discussion in arabic between the sheik and major kitchener he has seen your camels the major said turning to rupert and wants them thrown into the bargain when it is all over i have told him that this is quite out of the question the terms i have already agreed upon are ten times as high as he could earn with his camels in any other way besides it is as i pointed out to him probable that you and your brother may have to ride away alone on the camels but i have said that if you should arrive together at any port or place where the sum agreed upon can be paid to him and if you are thoroughly satisfied with the way in which you have been treated you will let him have them deducting from the amount to be paid half the sum that you have just given for them and as you paid for them in goods that will really be about the price they cost you that will be an excellent arrangement rupert said the hope of getting the camels at the end of the journey will certainly be a great inducement to him to be faithful i know that the arabs think as much of these fast camels as we do of racehorses at home and will you tell him too that if we have to leave him and take the camels i will see that they are left to be given up to him on his arrival at some place he may name i think that it would be as well that he should feel that he will get the camels anyhow in addition to payment otherwise the temptation to seize them might be so great that he might get rid of me on the first opportunity yes that would be as well clinton a pair of such camels as these are certainly a great temptation to an arab i have great faith in this man for he was highly recommended to me by some egyptian merchants at cairo who had traveled with him right down to the great lakes at the same time it is always better to throw no temptation in people's way he wanted a portion of the money down but i would not hear of this 
I said that he knew he was certain of it when the duty was performed, and that therefore there was no reason whatever for his making any demand beforehand, except that he should have a sum just sufficient and no more to enable him to pay any expenses he might incur for his own food and that of the camels. That is little enough. Dates, meal, a kid sometimes for the men, and an occasional feed of grain for the camels, who as a rule pick up their own living except when engaged on hard work. What Rupert had said was explained to the sheik, who, although he showed little outward satisfaction, was evidently pleased with the prospect of some day owning the two fast camels. There was now a long discussion between Major Kitchener and the sheik as to the best route to be pursued, and the probabilities as to the course that Edgar's captors had followed, and then the conference broke up, the sheik saying his camels required another two days rest, and that on the third day at daybreak he should be ready to start. At the last moment Rupert suggested— that as the Arabs had, they said, two spare camels before, and would now have three, he should present them with a sufficient load of rugs, powder, and other things they valued to form light loads for the three spare animals. There would be nothing suspicious in their possessing such goods, as many of the loaded camels had, especially on the night march to Medema, straight away or fallen, and their loads had been plundered by the Arabs. For twenty pounds he could get from the quartermaster's stores plenty of goods for the purpose, and as these could be used for barter it would obviate the necessity of carrying silver the offer added to the good temper of the sheik and his followers and as rupert walked back to major kitchener's tent with him the latter said i think clinton you have won your fellows fairly over i could see by the way they discuss the routes to be followed that they have got thoroughly interested in the matter themselves and will throw themselves heartily into it i really think you have a very fair chance of getting through this business safely I did not think so when you first proposed it to me, but the difficulty seemed to have disappeared as we have gone on, and now that I have seen you in disguise, I think that unless from some unforeseen accident or some forgetfulness on your own part, there is no reason why you should not travel with those Arabs from end to end of the Sudan. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Dash for Khartoum by G. A. Henty. Chapter Seventeen A Runaway Slave. Negroes have an immense respect for strength, and the, to him, astounding manner in which edgar had struck down his comrade as by a stroke of lightning completely cowed the other negro and he resumed his work with edgar with an air of timidity but he soon recovered from this and before long was laughing and joking at the speed with which the bucket was being raised and emptied the water pouring out at a rate vastly exceeding that usually achieved by their leisurely movements indeed he entered heartily into the fun of the thing repeating edgar's english words of now then up she goes over with her and working until the perspiration rolled down his black skin as fast as it did down edgar's white one the other man had thrown himself down by the trough and lay there bathing his face with water till at an angry shout from the sheik he rose to his feet and joined the work sullenly and silently there is no great harm done edgar said cheeringly to him you had no beauty to spoil so you will be none the worse that way you have had a lesson and it will do you good i dare say we shall get on very well together in the future hamish gave an angry growl he was in no mood for a reconciliation and continued to work silently until the sun went down as soon as it sunk below the sand hills the negroes ceased work and signified to edgar that their time of labor was over the sheik had several times looked out from his tent to see how the work was going. "'My capture was indeed a fortunate one, Amina,' he said. "'Never did I see men work as they have done this afternoon. Three times the usual amount of water has been poured over the field. Truly he is a treasure.' When the slaves had ceased work, they went to the lower end of the valley, where, on some ground covered with coarse grass, separated from the growing crops by a thorn hedge, a herd of goats and some twenty camels were grazing and proceeded to milk the females. Edgar was a passive spectator, for the animals all showed their aversion to his white skin, and would not let him approach them. When the work was over, they returned to the tents with the calabashes of milk, and were rewarded for their extra work with large platefuls of meal. 
before eating his share edgar filled a tin pannikin amina had given him for his special use with water boiled it over the fire and dropped in a spoonful of tea and going up to amina asked for a little milk which she readily gave him surprised that a spoonful or two was all that he required if i use it sparingly he said to himself as he sat down to his meal that ten pounds of tea will last me over a year and before it is gone i hope i shall see some way of getting off as soon as he had finished it the woman whose child was ill came to him and took him off to see her she was as even edgar could see better her skin was soft and her pulse was quieter but she was evidently very weak the woman held out a bowl of the arrowroot and signified that she would not eat it which edgar was not surprised at for it was thick and lumpy i suppose the water didn't boil he said to himself no wonder the poor little beggar cannot eat that stuff i should think the liebig would be the best for her at any rate better than this stuff i will get a tin or two from amina or rather she had better get it i don't want to be always asking for things he had noticed where he had thrown the little pot the evening before brought it to the woman and then pointing to the sheik's tent said you fetch the woman understood and went off and presently returned with two of the pots boiling water was required this was not an item to be found in an arab tent edgar therefore boiled some in his own tin over the fire in front of the sheik's tent and showed the woman how much of the paste was to be used and how much water when this was made he asked her for milk this also he boiled and made some arrowroot and told the woman to give that and the liebig alternately every three or four hours the benefit the child had received had created a most favorable impression towards edgar in the community and several of them came round him as he left the tent to ask for medicine edgar was sorely puzzled and determined that if he could do no good he would certainly do no harm he thought it likely that most of the illnesses were imaginary for why he said to himself as he looked at three of them who were all placing their hands on their stomachs and twisting about to show that they were suffering great pain should they be all bad together there was in the chest a large bottle of pills marked blue pills and of these he gave two to each applicant one case of those who applied was of a very different character it was a boy some fifteen years old he crawled up on his hands and knees and sitting down took off some bandages and showed him his leg it was terribly inflamed from the instep up to the knee with a great sloughing wound that showed to the bone for two or three inches it was evidently the result of a serious graze perhaps caused by falling on to a sharp rock had it been attended to at first it would have been trifling but doubtless the boy thought nothing of it and had continued to get about as usual the sand and dirt had got into the wound inflammation had set in and the leg was now in a very serious state edgar felt a little more certain of his ground this time for he remembered that one of the fellows at river smith's house had had a bad leg after a severe kick on the shin at football and he knew what had been done for it the lad's father who was one of the elderly men who had remained in camp had accompanied him edgar told him that in the first place he wanted a good deal of water made hot the chest contained a half gallon bottle of carbolic acid and searching among the smaller bottles edgar found one containing caustic when the lad's father returned with the hot water edgar bathed the wound for a long time then he poured a little of the acid into a calabash of cold water dipped a piece of cotton cloth into it folded it several times and laid it on the wound then wrapped another cloth soaked in water round and round the limb and explained as well as he could to the father that as often as the bandage became dry the one must be dipped in the calabash with the lotion the other in water and applied again for two or three days this treatment was continued and then edgar burned the unhealthy surfaces with caustic continuing the carbolic poultices in a week the inflammation had greatly abated and the sore assumed a healthy aspect the process of healing would in england have been a long and tedious work but in the dry air of the desert it healed with a rapidity that surprised edgar and in a fortnight the boy was able to walk again the girl too had gained strength rapidly and edgar was regarded in the encampment as a hakim of extraordinary skill and even the children who had at first shouted kaffir after him and thrown stones at him whenever they could do so unobserved now regarded him with something like awe while the friends of the boy and girl showed him many little kindnesses often giving him a bowl of camel's milk a handful of dates or a freshly baked cake of meal with one of the negro slaves he got on very well he could not be persuaded to continue to work with the energy which he had displayed the first afternoon but he seconded edgar's efforts fairly and his merry talk and laughter 
although he could understand but a small portion of what he said, cheered Edgar at his toil. The other negro remained sullen and hostile. For some days after his encounter with Edgar his face was so swollen up that he was scarcely able to see. He would have been compelled to work as usual, for humanity is not a characteristic of the Arabs, but Edgar told the sheik's wife that if the man was forced to work at present he would be very ill, and that he must for a time remain quiet and apply bandages soaked in hot water to his face. Under this treatment the swelling gradually abated, but the nose did not resume its normal shape, the bridge having been broken by Edgar's blow. Any presents that the latter received in the way of milk or other articles of food he shared with the negroes, the allowance of food served out being very scanty and of the coarsest description. Kaffirs are dogs, the sheik said to his wife, as he one day saw Edgar dividing some milk and dates with the others. But there is good in them. That Molly, for so they had named Edgar, divides all that is given him with the others, even giving Hamish a share. I could understand his giving it to the other, so that he might do some of his work for him, but not to Hamish, who I can see has not forgiven him that blow. I do not think the other does his work for him, Amina says. He works for me of a morning and then goes into the fields, and when I watch them to see that they are doing their work, it seems to me that he does more than any of them. He does, the sheik agreed. He is a willing slave. I am glad I did not give him up to the Mahdi. Kaffir as he is, I think he brings good luck to the village. If he would change his religion and follow the prophet, I would adopt him as my son, seeing that you have only girls. Edgar made very rapid process with the language. It was well for him that he picked up a few words and sentences at Saukim and Cairo, for this enabled him to make far more rapid progress than he would have done had he been ignorant of the language. He attempted to keep up a constant conversation with the negro, and although the latter often went into screams of laughter at his mistakes, he was ready to help him, correcting his errors and repeating sentences over and over again until he was able to pronounce them with a proper accent. In two months he was able to converse with tolerable fluency, and the sheik was meditating broaching the subject of his conversion to him when an event occurred that for a time gave him other matters to think of. One morning when the encampment woke, Hamish was found to be missing, and it was ere long discovered that the best camel in the encampment had been stolen, and that two water-skins had been taken from the sheik's tent, and a perfect hubbub arose in the village when this became known. The sheik, seizing a stick, fell upon the other negro, and showered blows upon him, exclaiming that he must have known of and aided his companion in his flight, although he declared he had not the least idea of his intentions. As soon as his first burst of rage was over, the sheik ordered four of the best camels to be saddled and water bottles to be filled. The fellow must be mad, he said as he walked up and down before his tent. He must know that he cannot escape. He would be known as a slave by the first people he comes upon, and it would only be a change of masters. And he would be long before he finds one so gentle as I have been with him. I do not think that he has gone away to make a change in masters, Amina said. It is worse than that, I fear. What is it, Amina? What do you mean? I fear that he has made for Khartoum to report that you have a white slave here. He hates Molly, and I think that it is to obtain vengeance on him he has fled. You are right, Amina. That is what the son of Shaitan tends to do. Quick, bring up those camels, he roared. Three of the men were ordered to accompany him. Then he gave orders that the rest of the camels should be loaded at once with his goods, the valuables of the village, and a portion of the crops, and that they should start without delay to the oasis of Wadi Elbar Nile, or the valley of the Dry River, two days' journey to the west, driving with them the herd of goats. If I do not catch him, we must break up the donar, he said, and all who do not wish to be found here by the Mahdi's men had best be in readiness to start when we return. Let half a dozen men and women go to the Wadi to look after the goats and guard the property. The camels must be brought back as soon as they get here. Ten minutes later, he and his three companions had disappeared from sight over the brow of the nearest sand hill, while all in the encampment were busy in preparing for their departure. A camel was allotted to each of the ten tents of which the camp consisted. Three camels were claimed by Amina for the sheik's possessions. The remaining six were to carry the food. All who were not engaged were at once set to work gathering the maize that was fit to pluck, and cutting and tying up into bundles the forage for the camels. In three hours a great change had been effected in the appearance of the little valley. The sheik's tent and three others remained standing, but the rest were leveled to the ground, their occupants preferring to start at once rather than risk being caught by the modests. It was midday when the party started. 
edgar could hardly help smiling at the appearance the camels presented each animal being almost hidden by the pile of baggage bundles cooking pots and articles of all kind at the top of which were perched a woman and two or three children the men walked as did many of the younger women and boys and girls it would be a fatiguing journey for they would travel without a halt until morning then rest until the sun was low again and again journey all night when they would reach the wells soon after daybreak as it was but a two days journey the camels carried far heavier loads than would have been placed upon them had it been one of the longer duration amina took the lead in the whole matter she gave orders to the men scolded the women and saw that everything was done in order do you think that the sheik has any chance of catching hamish edgar asked her as they stood together watching the retreating line of camels she shook her head very little she said unless the camel breaks down which is not likely or he misses the track when he once gains the cultivated land he will turn the camel adrift and will make his way on foot to khartoum he will avoid all villages where he might be stopped and go straight to the city where he will tell his story to the first officer of the mahdi he meets if the sheik does not overtake him before he gets beyond the limit of the desert he will pursue no further it would be useless he would never find him in the fields where he might lie down among the crops it would only be a waste of time to search for him does hamish know of the other wadi she nodded it may be that the modests will not follow further it will depend upon the orders they have received of course we shall leave someone here to watch and if they start for the wadi he will bring us news before they get there are there any other wells none nearer than six days journey to the south then there is a great cultivated country with many villages and towns but the journey would be terrible i do not know what we shall do but do not be afraid molly whatever we do you will not be given up until the last thing when my lord once sets his face one way he never turns it he has said the mahdi shall not have you for you are his captive and none others and he will never go back from that you have been very good to me edgar said and i would rather run my own risk than that suffering and perhaps death should fall upon the women and children of the douar my lord will never hear of it she said when he has said a thing he has said it there is nothing to do now but to wait until we learn what force is coming against us there is another encampment of the tribe in a wadi two days journey to the north and we may summon help from there if the party is not too strong the great thing will be to kill hamish for the wadi el bar nile is known only to a few of our own tribe and were he not with them they would not be able to find their way there even this wadi is known to few for it lies altogether beyond the track of caravans but now there is nothing to do but wait until my lord returns it will be i think on the fourteenth day you were eight days coming across the desert they will do it in six but will be eight on their return for there will be no occasion for haste hamish will take two more days to get to khartoum it may be a day or two before a party is sent out from there and they will take ten days getting here so that it should be some days at least after my lord's return before they appear i am sorry indeed to have been the cause of so much trouble falling upon you edgar said it is not your fault it was the will of allah that you should be brought here but anyhow we should not have stopped here much longer we have been here six months now and my lord was saying but a few days since that as soon as the rest of the crops were gathered he should send those who are not fit to travel to el bar nile and should leave you there and start with the camels to khartoum sell our crops there and then carry merchandise to el obeid or some other distant place he has been waiting for things to settle down we have only been stopping here so long because trade has been stopped by the siege of khartoum and since then he has not ventured to go there lest his camels should be seized by the mahdi but as he said he must risk something of what use is it to have camels if you do not employ them they are getting fat and lazy never had they had so long a rest before it matters nothing our having to leave this wadi the worst is that the mahdi will be set against us and that we shall have to move away far from here to get trade it is possible that at the present time khartoum is in the hands of the english edgar said we have heard no news from without since i came here three months ago now and by this time our expedition may have arrived there and the mahdi's power may be altogether broken i hope it may be so the woman said before the mahdi came the country was peaceful and prosperous there was employment and trade for our camels and all went about their occupations unmolested now everything is changed trade is at an end the villages are destroyed and the fields deserted i know not how it will end if the tribes would all turn together against them they would soon drive them out of the land but there is no hope of this we have our own quarrels and cannot unite even when everything is at stake 
the Mahdi may be the Mahdi, but what is that to us? He tells his followers that he will lead them to conquer Egypt and go to Jerusalem and Ruam, Constantinople. But how is he to do it when a handful of white soldiers defeated thousands of his men in the desert? What would it be were he to meet a great army of them? It is one thing to fight the Egyptians as they did at El Obeid, but another when it is your soldiers. I hear that multitudes of Osman Digma's men were slain down by the sea, and yet they say they fought well. They did fight well, Edgar said. I was there and saw it. No men could have been braver. But we have terrible weapons, and it was impossible for them to stand against them. The Mahdi may say what he likes, but there is no more chance of his taking Egypt as long as we stay there than there is of his flying. Well, well, the woman said, it will be as Allah chooses. You do not believe in Allah, Mully. You are a kafir. I beg your pardon, Edgar said. We and you worship the same God. We call him God, and you call him Allah, but it is the same. Your prophet acknowledges Moses and Christ to be prophets. The only difference between us is that you believe that Mohammed was also a prophet, and the greatest of all, while we do not acknowledge that, but in other respects there is no great difference between us. My lord will talk to you, Mully, but I am a woman, and these things are not for us. Early morning one of the boys remaining at the Doar was sent up to the crest of the sand hills, and there remained all day on watch. At the end of the thirteenth day the sheik's wife gave orders that everything should be in readiness for instant departure. The camels had returned on the previous day from El Bar Nile, having made two journeys there and back, and were now ready for a fresh departure. There was a further cutting of the crops until as much was gathered as would, with the remaining tents and goods, make up a full load for the camels, for as the party had not arrived it was almost certain that they had not succeeded in overtaking the fugitive. On the evening of the thirteenth day a shout from the boy on the hill proclaimed that he saw figures coming. "'How many of them?' one of the men shouted to him. "'There are five camels, but only four of them are ridden.' There was a shout of satisfaction. This looked as if the party had overtaken the fugitive, in which case they would have brought the camel back and left the body of Hamish in the desert. A shout of welcome greeted the chief as he rode up. "'You have overtaken him, El Bakat, I see.' Bishmillah, God be praised. We are safe from the trouble the treacherous dog would have brought upon us. The sheik shook his head. The son of Saitan has escaped. We caught sight of him just at the edge of the desert, having ridden with scarce an hour's rest from the time we started. As soon as we did so, Abu and myself dismounted and started in pursuit, but he must have seen us as soon as we caught sight of him, for when we came up to his camel it was alone. We followed him to the edge of the cultivated lands, but the grass was long and the crops stood in some places as high as our heads, and it would have been useless searching for him, so we brought the camels on, gave them water and a night's halt to fill themselves in the fields, and then started back. Has all been well? All has been well, his wife replied. The camels made three journeys, have rested, and are ready to start afresh. We have cut down as much as they can carry, and have indeed left but little remaining. We will start the day after tomorrow, the sheik said. Our camels need a rest, and time does not press. Before we leave the wadi, we will set fire to the dry stalks and grass. There is little that will not burn. We must destroy all that we can, so that when they arrive here in search of us, they will shall not be able to sit down here, but must turn and travel back with all speed, unless they decide to push on in pursuit of us to Wadi El Bar Nile. Two days later, the tents were struck and the camels loaded up. Then, when they had moved away, the dried grass and corn stalks were fired at the windward end of the valley, and in a few minutes the flames swept along in a broad sheet, and in a quarter of an hour a coating of gray ashes covered the soil where lately the encampment with its surroundings of cultivation stood. Two of the men were left behind with fast camels. They were to leave the animals a mile from the camp on its northern side, so that they would neither be on the line by which the enemy would come, or that leading to the wadi. They had forage for their camels and food for themselves for a fortnight. One was to remain by the camels, the other to keep watch concealed among the sand hills near the well. If an enemy was seen approaching, the watcher was to return at once to the camels, take his own animal, and ride to the wadi with news as to their strength. The other was to remain on watch until they either retired or set out on the track of the fugitives, when he was to push forward with all speed with the news. A messenger was also sent off to the Duar to the north, saying that an expedition of the Mahdi's men was on its way to plunder and destroy the encampments of the tribe, 
and begging them to send to el bar nile all their fighting men in order that the dervishes should have such a lesson that they would be well content to leave the tribes alone in the future as before the women and children were perched on the summit of their household goods on top of the camels contrary to their usual custom most of the men walked as the camels were loaded to the full extent of their powers edgar had manufactured for himself soon after his arrival at camp a pair of sandals from the skin of a goat that had been killed for food and he was therefore able to keep up with the camels with comfort as it was considered that there was no occasion for hurry and as the camels were very heavily laden three days instead of two were devoted to the journey and even then it was a very fatiguing one for those on foot on arriving at el bar nile edgar found that the oasis was much smaller than they had quitted the soil was rocky and although there were two large pools of clear water there was but little ground round them in any way suitable for cultivation acacias and other shrubs however grew thickly down the valley showing that there was a certain amount of moisture below the surface the tents were soon erected by the side of those of the first party and when the fires were lighted and the camels unloaded taken to the water and then turned loose to browse among the trees the place assumed a homelike appearance you can shoot molly the sheik said to edgar if i give you a gun will you fight against these dervishes certainly i will sheik your guns carry a long way they are wonderful weapons at metama men were killed two miles away yes they are good weapons sheik and i wish i had one of them here for i am afraid i should not be able to do much with your guns the sheik turned to his wife fetch out that kaffir gun amina and to edgar's surprise she brought out from the tent a martini rifle and a pouch filled with cartridges this gun had been found strapped on one of the camels that had been captured and the sheik had appropriated it for its own use concealing it in one of the bales so that edgar had not noticed it when the camels were unloaded i do not understand it the sheik said it is much stranger to me than our guns would be to you i tried to put these brass things with the bullet sticking out into it but they would not go into the barrel you shall show me how to use it but if the dervishes come i will hand it to you for you understand it and will do much better with it than i should but show me how it works the sheik's astonishment was great when edgar pushed the lever opened the breech inserted a cartridge and closing the breech said that it was now loaded and could be fired once fire at that rock he said and then load again as quickly as you can edgar did so and in a few seconds was ready again to fire inshallah the sheik exclaimed but it is wonderful no wonder that they tell me that the roar of the guns was like never ceasing thunder and that the sound of one shot could not be heard from another can you take out the cartridge without firing edgar showed him how this was done and the sheik then repeatedly loaded and unloaded a gun until he could manipulate it quickly and what is this thing he asked touching the back sight edgar explained to him that the sight was raised or lowered according to the distance of the object to be aimed at the franks are wonderful men the sheik said gravely if they had but the true faith and allah was with them no one could stand against them when the ammunition is used up can you make more edgar shook his head if i had caps to fit in here and a mold for the bullets i could refill these cases two or three times but after that they would be useless powerful machinery is used for making these cases it might be possible to have them made by hand by a skilled worker in brass in khartoum but it would be very expensive and i am afraid sheik when the ammunition is gone the gun would be useless unless you can procure some more cartridges from traders in egypt unless indeed my countrymen have retaken khartoum in which case i could obtain for you any quantity of cartridges your countrymen have retired to Korti, the sheik said edgar gave a cry of disappointment he had feared that when the news of gordon's death was known the expedition might be abandoned but he had still retained some hopes that it might advance to khartoum the news that they had already fallen back to Korti came as a shock how did you learn the news sheik he asked presently you did not say that you had spoken to anyone yes we went a little way into the fields in hopes of catching sight of hamish and came upon two peasants who were gathering the crop they had seen nothing of the negro upon questioning them as to what was going on at khartoum they said that the mahdi was still all-powerful that the kaffirs had fallen back from medema and were scattered along the river between korti and dongola that the mahdi had announced that his forces would ere long advance conquer egypt and destroy the kaffirs 
do you mean to wait for the attack of the Mahdi's men here or go out to meet them edgar said after a long pause if they come here too numerous to fight we must fly but if they are not too strong we will give them battle here why should we go to meet them it is for you to decide edgar said i know nothing of your arab ways of fighting but it seemed to me that it might be better if they are not altogether too strong to meet them as near the other wells as we can but why so mully they would have water close to them and we should have none if one was wounded he would have to be carried a long distance why do you advise that we should fight them there you told me sheik that the existence of this well was only known to you and your people and a small section of the tribe that is so molly it is a secret that has been well guarded the wadi has served as a retreat many times in our history if they come on and any of them go back again the secret will be a secret no longer edgar said it is for this reason that i thought that we had better go out and meet them there is but one man with them who knows the way hither and against him our balls should be all directed if we kill him they would be without a guide and would be unable to find the way for they would never venture into this desert knowing that if they failed to find our well they might all perish for want of water you speak well the sheik said i had not thought of this but i see that your plan is a good one as soon as i learn that they have arrived at the wells we will set out to meet them unless their force is altogether too strong for us on the seventh day after their arrival at the wadi the messenger who had been dispatched for aid returned his news was that the greater part of the men were away they were expected in a few days but it might be a week or more before they came back the sheik was unwilling to send off the few men at the douar but promised that as soon as his main force returned he would set out with the whole strength of his fighting men to their assistance upon the following morning one of the men left to watch the wells also returned he had come through without stopping and reported that late in the evening before he left he and his companions had seen a line of camels with some horsemen coming towards the wells he had waited until morning in order to discover their force he put it down as forty men that is very bad news the sheik said we can only muster eighteen fighting men and some of these are old and others mere lads they are two to one against us and if we were beaten and forced to fly their horsemen would overtake us and destroy us think it over molly you are full of expedients how many men do you expect to get from the other douar their encampment is the same size as ours they are sure to leave some of the old men to guard it perhaps fifteen will come that will make our force nearly equal to theirs and we might defend this wadi though i doubt it but i am sure that they would beat us easily in the desert they are almost all armed with the rifles that they took at el obeid from hicks pasha's men and will have found an abundance of arms at khartoum besides these dervishes fight desperately the faith they have in the mahdi gives them strength and courage they do not care whether they die or live and doubtless picked men have been sent out on the expedition i fear there is not before us but flight unless you with your knowledge of the frank method of war can hit upon some plan i will think it over sheik but at present i see no way in which we can withstand them we might of course cut down trees and make so strong a fort here that we might beat them off but in that case they might return in much greater numbers and therefore it seems to me that if we fight we must fight at the other wadi then we cannot fight at all the sheik said decisively there are two to one against us and it would be madness to attack them when they could with their horsemen cut off all retreat i will think sheik edgar said rising and walking away in half an hour he returned i have thought of a plan sheik but it is not without great danger i care not for danger the sheik said so that it be but possible my idea is this that we should load up all your camels with closely pressed bundles of forage then that we should advance a day's march across the desert and there that we should form a zaraba with the forage we should of course take water skins with us with sufficient to last for at least a week i should send the camels back again as soon as they are unloaded and should order those who remained behind to load all their goods upon them and to set out either for the other douar of your tribe or for the villages to the south i should send a messenger to the other douar to say that we are going to defend the zaraba to the last and praying them to come at once to our rescue promising the moment they appear to sally out and fall upon the dervishes while they attack them in rear 
your messenger should point out that before they arrive a number of the enemy will certainly have fallen in their attack upon us and we shall therefore be decidedly superior to them in point of numbers the plan is a bold one the sheik said but do you think that it would be possible for us to defend the zareba i think so sheik it need be but a small one some twelve feet square inside they will have to cross the open to attack us and outside we can protect it by a facing of prickly shrubs we will do it the sheik said in a tone of determination springing to his feet one can but die once and if we succeed it will be a tale for the women of our tribe to tell for all time end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of dash for khartoum this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Olson at Facebook.com slash Joyvoy. That's J-O-Y-V-O-I. Dash for Khartoum by G.A. Henty. Chapter 18. The Zaraba. No sooner had the sheik decided to carry out Edgar's plan then he rapidly issued his orders. In five minutes the whole of the inhabitants of the Duar were at work, the boys going out to fetch the camels, the men cutting down the long grass near the well and laying it in great bundles very tightly pressed together, the women cooking a large supply of flat cakes for the party. In two hours the preparations were completed and the twenty men moved off from the oasis. They travelled until ten o'clock in the evening. By the light of the moon, which was four days short of full, the sheik and Edgar selected a point for the erection of the zareba. It was a patch of rock cropping up from the summit of a sand hill that fell away from it on all sides and was just about the size required for the zareba. The camels were unloaded and the bundles of forage laid down side by side and formed into a square, the wall being some four feet thick and two feet high. The whole party, including the boys who were to take back the camels, then set to work to cut thorny bushes. These were piled thickly at the foot of the rock all round, being kept in their places by stakes driven into the sand and by ropes interlacing them. The work was only completed just as daylight broke. I don't think, Edgar said, walking round the little fort, that any men can get through this hedge of thorns until they have pulled it away piece by piece and that with us lying in shelter above and firing down upon them will be a difficult task indeed the arabs who had obeyed the chief's orders with reluctance and had been very silent upon the journey out were now jubilant feeling convinced that they could beat off the attack of such a force as that which they heard was advancing the camels were now sent off and they had scarcely disappeared among the sand hills when an Arab was seen approaching on a camel. It is our scout, the sheik said. He brings us news. He tied a cloth to the end of a spear and waved it. A minute later the camel's course was changed, and the rider soon arrived outside the fort. What is your news, Yusuf? They are going to start this morning, the man said. I crept in as soon as it became dark last night and made my way close up to them, and I gathered that they have decided to march this morning on to Wadi el Barnail. They could not stay where they were any longer, as they had only brought with them sufficient food for the camels for the march to the Wadi, where they made sure they should find an abundant supply, and having given them a day's rest, they were going to push forwards at once to the next Wadi, where they made certain of finding the fugitives. Will they be here tonight? Edgar asked the sheik. I should think not, Molly. The regular halting place is five miles away, and as that is about halfway, they will probably stop there and start perhaps an hour before daybreak. The scout was sent off to the woody with the news, and the little garrison spent the day in strengthening their fort, making another hedge of bushes three or four yards beyond the other, and gathering a large number of the heaviest stones they could find. These were laid on the grass rampart, which was thus raised in height nearly a foot, openings being left in the stones through which the defenders could thrust their guns and fire without exposing their heads to the shots of the assailants. 
this still further added to the confidence of the arabs and when all was completed they indulged in defiant gestures and wild yells signifying contempt in the direction from which the enemy would probably advance at nightfall two of the men were posted as sentries as it was possible the Mahdi's might push straight forward there was however no alarm during the night but just as day broke the sentries reported that there were horsemen to be seen in the distance as there was no object in concealment all leapt to their feet nine horsemen were seen on the brow of a sandhill some two miles away they were presently lost sight of as they descended into a dip and a minute or two later the line of camels was seen following in their steps the spear with the cloth was elevated as a flag and when the horsemen appeared on the next sandhill it was evident by the suddenness with which they pulled up their horses that they saw it half a minute later they started again this time at a canter when they came within half a mile the sheik asked why do you not fire mole your gun will carry that distance easily double that distance if necessary sheik it is better not to let them know that we have such a gun here until they get close it will be better for you to fire the sheik levelled his long gun and fired and the horsemen at once drew up and after a little consultation two or three of them rode off on each flank so as to make a circuit of this unlooked-for obstacle while one of the others rode back at full speed to meet the camel train as soon as it arrived the riders of whom there were two on each animal dismounted the camels were led back to a hollow where they would be safe from any stray bullet and after a short pause one of the horsemen again advanced and at a rapid pace made a circle round the fort at a distance of two or three hundred yards only a scattered fire was opened by the defenders but the speed at which he was riding disconcerted their aim and having completed the circuit he rode off with a yell of defiance to rejoin the party for half an hour no move was made it was evident that the strength of the position had disconcerted the dervishes who had expected to gain an almost bloodless victory as however hamish assured them that at the very utmost the sheik could put but twenty men in the field including several boys and old men it was finally decided to attack and headed by the horsemen the dervishes started forward at a run uttering shrill yells as they did so edgar had persuaded the chief that it would be useless to open fire until they were within two or three hundred yards as but few shots would tell and the men would be discouraged by finding that their fire did not check the advance the sheik therefore commanded his followers on no account to fire until he gave the order the dervishes however were not sparing of their ammunition and fired as they ran the balls going for the most part wide although a few whistled over the heads of the defenders and two or three struck the rampart now i think they are near enough sheik edgar who had levelled his rifle at one of the horsemen said as he spoke he pulled the trigger and simultaneously with a sharp crack of the piece the arab threw up his arms and fell from his horse the sheik and five of his men fired almost at the same moment kneeling as closely as they could there was room for but seven along the face of the fort fronting the enemy and at edgar's suggestion the chief had divided the men into three parties each of which after firing was to fall to the rear and reload their places being taken by the others in succession thus there would always be a reserve and the fire could be kept up without interruption volley after volley was fired edgar loading quickly enough to repeat his fire with each squad so rapidly did the arabs pass over the intervening ground that they reached the outside hedge of thorns just as the party who had first fired had again taken their places in front five of the dervishes had fallen and several were wounded but this had not checked their speed for a moment and under the orders of their leaders they at once fell to work with their swords and knives to destroy the hedge the work was done far more rapidly than edgar had thought possible and they then fell upon the more formidable obstacle piled up against the rocks attacking it on three sides simultaneously the defenders now fired independently each as fast as he could load edgar shouting continuously steady steady take good aim each time and the sheik re-echoing his words the arabs however were too excited to obey and the greater part of their shots were thrown away several of the dervishes had fallen but the process of clearing away the hedge proceeded with alarming rapidity 
The work was, however, speedily abandoned at the face where Edgar was stationed, for at each crack of his rifle a dervish fell. Leaving three of the men to defend that face, the rest joined the defenders at the sides, the sheik taking the command on one side, Edgar on the other. The fire now became more steady, the sheik enforcing his orders by vigorous blows with the staff of his spear, while Edgar's rifle on his side more than made up for his want of influence with the men. In their fury, several of the dervishes sprang boldly into the midst of the thorns and strove to climb up, but they were met by the spears of the defenders, and not one gained an entrance. It was less than ten minutes after the first shot had been fired, when the leader of the dervishes, seeing how fast his men were falling, and that they would soon be no stronger than the defenders of the fort, called them off from the attack. As they turned and ran, the defenders leapt to their feet with yells of triumph. But the dervishes, turning round, fired several shots. The sheik received a ball in his shoulder, and two of his companions fell dead. The others at once took to their shelter again, and kept up their fire until long after the last of the dervishes was out of range. The moment the retreat began, Edgar looked out for his man, of whom he had not hitherto caught a glimpse in the heat of the conflict. He soon caught sight of him, and taking a steady and careful aim with his rifle on a stone, fired, and Hamish fell headlong forward, the ball having struck him fair between the shoulders. A yell of triumph rose from the Arabs. The traitor who had brought the Modis down upon them was punished. The one man who could guide the foe to the wadi was killed. As soon as the enemy got out of reach of shot, they gathered in consultation. The defenders could see that the discussion was excited and violent. They waved their arms, stamped, and seemed on the point of coming to blows with each other. While they were so engaged, the garrison looked out at the field of battle round the fort. No less than fifteen of the assailants had been killed, while of the defenders but two, the one an old man and the other a boy, had fallen. The sheik begged Edgar to bandage his shoulder. He seemed to feel the pain but little. So delighted was he with the issue of the contest. Edgar soaked a pad of the cotton cloth and laid it on the wound, and then with long strips of the same material bandaged the arm tightly to the side, and with other strips fastened as well as he could the pad in its place. They are scattering over the sand hills, one of the Arabs said just as he had finished, and in a short time a dropping fire was opened at the fort. The Arabs would have replied, but the sheik said that it was a waste of powder, for their guns would not carry as far as the rifles in the hands of the dervishes, and it was better that they should lie quiet behind their shelter and allow the enemy to throw away their fire. What will they do next, do you think, sheik? I do not think they will make another attack, Mole. At any rate, not in the daytime. They must know they are not greatly superior to us in force, being now but twenty-five to our eighteen and no doubt many of them are wounded. They may try to besiege us. They will know that we have a supply of water. We should never have shut ourselves up here without it, but that will fail in time. But their own supply will fail, Edgar said. Probably they have only brought enough with them for what they supposed would be a two days' march to the wadi. I should think, Mule, they will send all their camels back to the wells, perhaps with one of their wounded men and another. The wounded man will remain there in charge of them. The other will bring two or three of them out with full water skins. He can make the journey there and back every two days and bring enough water for the men and horses. I don't think they will send the horses away. They will do with a small portion of water, and if greatly needed they could start from here at sunset, keeping among the sand hills until out of sight. Reach the wells, drink their fill, and be back in the morning. If they attack at night, it will be between the setting of the moon and daybreak. I should hardly think they would do that, Edgar said. We shall soon restore the thorn hedge, and they would scarcely be mad enough to attack us when they know that we have that protection, and are almost as strong as they are. If it were not that we do not want them to know the way to the wadi, I should say that we could venture to sally out and march back. But that would cost us a good many lives for the horsemen could ride on ahead, dismount, open a fire on us from the sand hills, and be off again on their horses when we went up to attack them. No, I think we cannot do better than follow our original plan. 
our water will hold out for a week, and by putting ourselves on short allowance at the end of a day or two, if we find that they are determined to wait, we can make it last for nearly a fortnight. And long before that, your tribesmen ought to be here, and in that case only the mounted men will escape us. Three of their horses lie dead outside, so there are but five left. Ah, uh, if we could but cut them all off, the sheik said in a tone of fury, then we might be safe for a long time. If any of them get back to tell the tale, the Mahdi will send a force next time that there will be no resisting. Edgar sat thinking for a minute or two. I have an idea, Sheik, he said at last. Send off one of your boys as soon as the moon sets. Let him go to El Bar Nile. When your friends arrive, he will tell them of the repulse we have given the dervishes, and that there are now but twenty-five of them, several of whom are doubtless wounded. Tell them that if but ten men come to aid us we can defeat them let the other ten that is if twenty arrive start first and turning off the track make a detour and come down at night upon the wadi there they will find but one man with the camels but they must not show themselves but must hide close at hand then when the horsemen arrive they must make an ambush and either shoot them down as they pass or let them go through to the wells they are sure to wait there for a few hours and they can fall upon them there let the men be ordered to fire only at the horses they can deal with the men after they have dismounted the great thing is to prevent the horsemen getting away Allah, Mule, your plan is a grand one had you been bred in the desert you could not have better understood our warfare what a pity it is that you are a kafir you would have been a great sheik had you been a true believer golden pasha was a kafir edgar replied but he was greater than any sheik he was a great man indeed the sheik said he was a very father to the people there was no withstanding him we fought against him for our interest lay with the slave dealing but he scattered us like sheep yes gordon was a great man though as you say he was a kafir and the sheik sat in silence meditating upon what seemed to him an inscrutable problem while the conversation had been going on, the bullets of the enemy continued to whistle round the zareba. I will try and put a stop to that, Edgar said. We have a rifle here as much better than theirs, as theirs are superior to the guns of your tribesmen. The nearest hill was some four or five hundred yards away, and on this several of the Arabs could be seen. Sure that they were nearly out of gunshot, they took but little pains to conceal themselves. Edgar rested his rifle on a stone and took a steady aim at three of them who were sitting together. He fired. A yell of dismay came across the air. Two of the figures leapt to their feet and ran back. A moment later, four or five others who had been firing from among the bushes also dashed away, while a triumphant yell rose from the Zeraba. That is one enemy the less, Edgar said, and I don't think the others will trouble us much in future. They must know that they can be doing us no harm. <laughs> and now they discover they are not going to have it all their own way, we shall not hear much more of them. Shots were indeed fired occasionally from the bushes and eminences, but the discharges were far apart, and seemed to be intended rather to show the defenders of the Zeraba that they were surrounded than for any other purpose. The day passed without any further event. As soon as the sun had fairly set, the defenders sallied out and repaired the hedge. The enemy probably guessed that they were so employed, and kept up a much heavier fire than they had done during the day. Edgar, lying in the Zeraba, replied, steadily firing at the flashes, and after a time the firing of the enemy slackened, and the defenders, when they had completed the hedge, re-entered the Zeraba through a very narrow gap that had been left for the purpose, carrying with them one of their number whose leg had been broken just above the ankle by one of the enemy's bullets under the sheik's instructions some rough splints were made to keep the bone in its proper position and bandages were then applied four sentries were posted one at each corner of the fort and the rest of the garrison lay down to sleep twice during the night they sprang to their feet at the discharge of the gun of one of the sentries but as no movement of the enemy followed they soon lay down again supposing that either the alarm had been a false one and that the sentry had fired at some low bush, or that, if he had really seen a man, 
the latter had made off as soon as he had discovered that the garrison were awake and vigilant. As soon as the moon set, the sheik dispatched one of the young men to the wadi. His instructions were to crawl carefully, taking advantage of every bush until he deemed himself well beyond any of the enemy who might be watching, and then to start at full speed. If he were fired at, he was, if the enemy were still in front of him, to run back to the Zeruba. If they were behind him, to press forward at full speed. For an hour after he had left, the garrison listened anxiously. They were all under arms now, lest the enemy should try an attack during the darkness. No sounds, however, broke the stillness of the plain, and they were at last assured that their messenger had got safely through. For four days the blockade continued, an occasional exchange of shots being kept up. The dervishes, however, since they had learnt the range of Edgar's rifle, seldom showed themselves, but crept among the rocks and bushes, fired a shot, and then crawled off again to repeat the operation fifty or a hundred yards away. When the hedge had been repaired on the night after the fight, the defenders buried their own dead in the sand a short distance off and had dragged the bodies of their fallen enemies fifty yards away, as, had the siege lasted many days, the fort would have otherwise become uninhabitable. In the morning, one of the Arabs had yelled to the besiegers that the bodies were lying fifty yards away in front of the fort, and that four of them were free to come and carry them away or bury them as they chose. The invitation passed unregarded, but during the next night the bodies were all removed. The sentries were ordered not to fire if they heard any noise in that direction, for, as Edgar pointed out to the sheik, it was important that the bodies should be carried away. The next day several of the Arabs went out and raised heaps of sand over the horses that still lay just outside the hedge. The fourth night after his departure, the messenger returned with the news that the tribesmen, eighteen in number, had arrived in the afternoon. They would carry out the sheik's orders. They were mounting fresh camels just as he started. Nine of them would hide among the sand hills two or three miles away, and would there remain for twenty-four hours so as to give time for the others to get up to the wells. The sheik commanding the party had suggested that soon after daybreak the defenders of the fort should sally out and advance in the direction where the dervish's camp was situated, as if intending to make an attack. This would bring in all the enemy who might be scattered among the sand hills near the Zaraba. As soon as the engagement began, he, with his men, would fall upon the rear of the dervishes. Do you think that that is a good plan, Molay? I think so, Sheik. You see, if we merely wanted to defeat them, one would not wish them to rally into one body. But as our great object is to prevent any from returning, it is much better to do as the Sheik suggests, and let them get all together. The day passed as usual, and the next morning, shortly before sunrise, the defenders of the fort issued out. The assailants were on the watch, and from four or five different points round the Zeraba shots were fired. Taking advantage of every bush, the Arabs advanced slowly under the direction of their sheik. The dervishes, believing that the garrison must have been driven from their defences by thirst, and that they were now in their power, rapidly gathered their force and advanced to meet their opponents. At first they did so carelessly but they were checked by the fall of one of their leaders by a ball from Edgar's rifle. They then advanced a little more cautiously. Edgar kept close to the sheik. They will make a rush soon, he said. Tell the men not to fire till they rise to their feet. Where are the others? the sheik growled. If they do not come, we shall be outnumbered. Not by much, sheik. One or two of their men are certainly away with the camels, and we shall drop two or three more of them at least when they make their rush. The others are sure to be up directly. There, look, there they are on the top of the sand hills the dervishes have been firing from. The enemy had now approached to within a hundred yards, and were just preparing for a rush, when a shout of welcome broke from the party in front of them, and was at once echoed from the rear. The dervishes sprang to their feet in surprise and alarm, but one of their leaders exclaimed, There are but a few of them. Slay these in front first, then we will destroy those in our rear. With a yell of defiance, the dervishes dashed forward. The sheik's party poured in a volley as they did so, and then grasping their spears sprang to their feet, Edgar alone remaining prone and firing four more shots as the dervishes traversed the intervening space. There was little disparity of numbers when the parties met, 
the sheik had at edgar's suggestion ordered his men to form in a compact group with their spears pointing outward as the great point was to withstand the rush until their friends came up but the dervishes recklessly threw themselves upon the spears and in a moment all were engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand fight edgar feeling that with a clubbed rifle he should have no chance against the spears and swords of the arabs kept between the sheik and two of his most trusted followers and loading as quickly as he could throw out and drop in the cartridges brought down four men who rushed one after another upon them it seemed an age to him but it was scarce more than a minute after the combatants had closed that with a shout the ten newcomers arrived on the scene edgar dropped a fresh cartridge into his rifle and stood quiet he had no wish to join in the slaughter the dervishes fought desperately and none asked for quarter and in two or three minutes the combat was over and all had fallen save three or four men who had extricated themselves from the fight and dashed off at the top of their speed quickly pursued by the exultant victors to edgar's surprise they did not run in the direction of the sand hill behind which he had thought their camp was made but bore away to the south pursuers and pursued were soon out of sight and edgar turned to see how his companions had fared three of them had been killed and six of the others had received spear thrusts or sword cuts more or less severe it would have gone hard with us sheik if our friends had not come up we should have beaten them the sheik said that gun of yours would have turned the scale had it not been for that they would have been too strong for us for they were all fighting men in their prime and five or six of my men were no match for them in a hand-to-hand -hand fight Masha'Allah, it has been a great day it will be talked of long in our tribe how with but twenty men and many of these not at their best we withstood forty dervishes and so beat them that when a reinforcement of eight men came to us we destroyed them altogether four may have got away edgar said they must have left their horses in the direction in which they fled i suppose they feared that some of us might crawl out and hamstring them did they picket them near their camp when i first saw our friends on the hill my first thought was that we had done wrong not to bid them secure the horses before they attacked now i see that they could not have found them and it was well you sent no such orders for had you done so they might have lost time looking for them and have arrived late for half an hour those unwounded of the party were occupied in bandaging up the wounds of the others at the end of that time the men who had pursued the fugitives had arrived have you caught them the sheik asked as they approached we overtook two and killed them but the others reached the horses a man was waiting there in charge of them and the three rode off leading the fourth horse but never fear our men will catch them at the next wells the bodies of the fallen dervishes had been examined and it was found that among the fallen were all the leaders these being distinguishable by their gay garments from the others who simply wore the long white shirt that formed with a coloured straw skull-cap the uniform of the Mahdi's men the two men who had escaped belonged to the rank and file the joy of the arabs was extreme they loaded and fired off their muskets yelled danced and gesticulated they did not believe in the Mahdi, but his followers had come to be considered among them as invincible it was therefore a triumph indeed for the tribe that this invading party had been annihilated the newcomers were surprised at finding a white man among the defenders of the fort and the sheik was so proud of his possession that he did not hesitate to say that their successful defence was chiefly due to the advice of the slave whom he described as being although so young a great captain preparations were now made for a start the camels of the newcomers were brought up from the spot where they had left them on advancing to take part in the fight the six wounded men each mounted a camel behind its rider the sheik and three of his principal followers mounted behind the riders of the other four camels the rest proceeded on foot two men being left behind at the fort with instructions that when the eight men who had gone on to the other wadi returned with their own camels and the seventeen camels of the dervishes all were to be loaded up to the extent of their power with the bundles of forage that had done such good service as the basis of the fort for the supply at the wadi had been very nearly all cut down and food would be required for the camels until a fresh supply sprang up the wadi was reached at sunset 
and a messenger was at once sent off to the spot where in accordance with the sheik's orders the women and children with the camels were halted until news should arrive of the result of the fight it was six miles away and it was midnight when the party arrived great fires had been lighted and there was a scene of the liveliest rejoicing as the women and children arrived there was no thought of sleep that night the story of the battle was told over and over again every incident being rehearsed with appropriate gesture and even the friends of the six who had fallen restrained their grief for the time partly from pride that they had died so honourably partly because any show of grief would have been out of place amid the rejoicings for so great an exploit with the exception of the children edgar was the only occupant of the douar who closed an eye that night he had waited up until the return of the camels and women had assisted to unload the animals with the sheik's tent and baggage and to put things into something like order and had then withdrawn himself from the groups of excited talkers by the fire and thrown himself down among the bushes some distance away he had had but little sleep from the time the party had marched to meet the dervishes it was upon his advice that they had gone and he felt himself to some extent responsible for the result during the time the siege had lasted scarce half an hour had passed without his rising to see that the sentries were vigilant and to assure himself that the silence of the desert was unbroken the night before he had not thought of sleep he had no doubt that the arabs who were coming to their assistance would do their best to arrive at the right moment still something might occur to detain them a little and although the arabs had behaved with great bravery hitherto he felt sure that in a fight in the open they would be no match against the fanatical dervishes who always fought with a full assurance of victory and were absolutely indifferent as to their own lives he had seen them three times at work and held their courage in the deepest respect the next day there was a grand feast several kids being slaughtered for the purpose the following morning a caravan was seen approaching and the whole encampment turned out to meet it the men discharging their guns and shouting cries of triumph and welcome to which the newcomers replied with many shouts in front of the caravan two horses were led then followed the camels of the dervishes behind which came those of their captors the sheik pressed forward to the leader of the party there were four horses and three men he said have you them all two of the horses and the men were killed he replied the others as you see we captured allah be praised the sheik said fervently then not one of the dervishes has escaped and the secret of our place of refuge here is preserved some more kids were killed and another grand feast was held the captured camels were divided between the two parties the sheik took one of the horses and the leader of the other party the second and on the following morning the rescuing party started on their return journey to the wadi they had left a week before greatly satisfied with their journey they had lost three men in the fight with the dervishes but were richer by eight camels a horse and the arms and ammunition of ten of the dervishes that being the number they had accounted for while thirty had been killed by the defenders of the zareba edgar had been fully occupied during those days assisting the negro slave who had remained with the party left behind in looking after the camels drawing water and fetching wood for the fire the sheik had spoken little to him since his return being busied with the duties of entertaining his guests but it was evident that he had highly commended him to his wife who bestowed upon him night and morning a bowl of camel's milk in addition to his ordinary rations after the caravan had started the sheik called him into his tent muley he said you have done us a great service i acted upon your advice and it has turned out well and you have shown that you are a brave fighter as well as one strong in counsel i have no son and if you are willing to accept the true faith i will adopt you as my son and you will no longer be a slave but one of the tribe edgar was silent for a minute or two thinking over how he had best couch his refusal in terms that would not anger the sheik then he said i am indeed grateful for your offer sheik which does me great honour but were i to accept it i know that even in your eyes i should be viewed with contempt had our people captured metemma when you were there and carried you off a prisoner 
I know well that you would have treated with scorn any offer my people might have made you of a post of honour and wealth among us, if you would have abjured Mohammed and become a Christian. You would have died first. That would I indeed, the sheikh exclaimed hotly. Honourable men do not change their religion for profit, sheikh. You were born a follower of the prophet, I was born a Christian. We both believed what we were taught as children. It is in our blood and cannot be changed. Were I to say the words that would make me a Mohammedan, you know well that I should say them with my lips and not with my heart, that I should be a false Mohammedan as well as a false Christian. I could as easily change the colour of my skin as my religion, and you in your heart would be the first to condemn and despise me, did I do so. The sheikh sat for some time stroking his chin in silence. You are right, Moulay, he said at last. A man cannot change his religion as he can his coat. I did not think of it when I made the offer. But as you say, I would rather die a thousand deaths than abjure Mohammed. And though I now think you worthy to be my son and to become a sheikh after me, I might not think you worthy did you become a renegade. Believe me, sheikh, Edgar said, rising. I feel deeply the kindness of your offer, and so long as I remain with you, I shall take as much interest in the tribe as if I were a member of it, and I shall do my best to prove myself your faithful slave. You saved my life by refusing to hand me over to the Mahdi. I shall never forget it, and shall be ready at all times to risk it for you, for my kind mistress, and for the tribe. You have spoken well, Mole, and although I am sorry, I cannot feel angered at your decision. Edgar saw that the interview was over, and left the tent, well content that he had been able to refuse the offer without exciting the anger of the sheik. For another two months the tribe remained in the wadi. By that time forage was running short, and the sheik announced his intention of leaving it for a time, and of going to El Obeid, where he might obtain employment for his camels by some trader. Edgar was pleased at the news. His chances of escape from their present position in the desert were small indeed, but opportunities might present themselves during a trading journey. He knew that some time must yet elapse before he could speak the language sufficiently well to hope to pass as a native, although he could make himself understood fairly and comprehend the purport of all that was said to him. Still, he would gain an acquaintance with the country and learn more of its peoples. He saw that he could not hope to pass as one of the Arab tribesmen, but that if his escape was to be made at all, it must be in the disguise of a trader in one of the towns. Four days later the tents were levelled, the belongings of the tribes packed on the camels, and the caravan left the wadi on its march across the desert. End of chapter 18 Recording by Heidi Olson At facebook.com slash joyboy Facebook.com slash J-O-Y-V-O-I